Hey guys, this is Patrick from SDH, and today we're gonna talk about this switch in front of me. This is the Microtik CRS 518 16XS 2XQ. That may sound like a whole lot of gobbledygook, but let me explain what that means. Basically, this is one of the Microtik's cloud router series, which is a CRS, and the 518 tells us that we have a 18 port switch. And then we will see on the front of this, we have a total of 16 SFP28 ports, plus two of the QSFP28 ports. And that means that there are a total of 16 25 gigabit ethernet ports and two 100 gigabit ports on this switch as well. If you're building a small medium business network or you just have a small data center installation or something like that, uh, or you just have a really fancy home lab, this switch might be the perfect option. In this video, we're gonna take a look at the hardware. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the management situation of the switch, which is interesting, as well as I wanna talk about some of the new features and then uh, performance, power consumption. We'll talk definitely about noise. And and then I'm gonna give what might be a little bit of a controversial opinion about the switch at the end in my final thoughts. And hey, just so you guys know, Microtech did send us this switch. We do have another one that we purchased. Um, we're probably gonna be buying more of these switches, but also uh, this they did not sponsor like this video. They're not paying for this video or anything like that. Um, and if you do wanna help us out and actually help us go buy things like, you know, all the little modules and stuff to go plug into this thing, something that you can do now is you can actually join our STH YouTube channel. You can find that below. And if you do that, it just kind of helps us buy the little odds and ends that we need to keep the site running. With that, let's get to the hardware. Okay, so taking a look at the switch, what you're gonna see up front, big features, you'll see that on the side over here, we have two QSFP28 ports. Now these are the 100 gigabit ethernet ports. Now on the side of those, we have a 16 SFP28 port block, which means that we have a total of 16 25 gigabit ethernet ports. And since I know folks are gonna ask, we did and you can run uh, 40 gig ethernet on the QSFP. Uh, so you can run QSFP plus into the QSFP 28 ports. And on the SFP side or SFP 28 side, you can run SFP plus for 10 gigabit as well as SFP for one gigabit. Although uh, in general, I tell people that this is probably not the right switch if you're gonna be you know, using a lot of like one gigabit, uh, like, like fiber connections, you probably are better off just getting a lower power uh, switch for that or lower expense switch for that, right? The other feature though, which is really nice is that on the front of the switch, you're gonna see that we have both a serial console as well as a management port. So even though this switch is mostly a 25 gig and a 100 gig switch, there is a one gig port, which is really used for management. It's a little bit funky how that's connected. So you'll see people online and people will say like, oh yes, you can actually go bridge a connection between the 100 gig port all the way over to the one gig port. But just know when you're doing that, you're actually bridging a connection from the uh, Marvell switch chip over to the uh, Qualcomm like uh, like management CPU, and that's how you're actually doing that bridging. So it, the performance on that is not, uh, that wouldn't be what you consider like a wise network architecture. However, for things like having an out-of-band management port, that is absolutely awesome. And frankly, I think that all switches at this point should have an out-of-band management port. If you look at like the high-end switches, it's a very, very common feature. It just makes it so easy to go through that one gig port onto a management network and then just use it from there so you can have your management separated from all of your data ports. Okay, so looking at the back of the switch, there are essentially just two features back here. We have power supplies and fans. Now, in terms of the power supplies, these are redundant 150 watt units. And just to be clear, it may not sound like 150 watts is a lot, especially when we talk about 25 gig or 100 gig switch. It's not really a lot. That's actually, this is a very low power platform, but these, these power supplies, they're really realistically in the switch, not gonna hit 150 watts. They're not even gonna come close to that. I doubt that they're gonna hit 100 watts. We'll talk a little bit more about power consumption later and you'll understand why. But the big thing is that Microtik, even though this is a relatively low cost switch in the market for this class of switch, Microtik Microtik still is using redundant power supplies and they're hot swappable. So you don't have to have a switch just because it's low cost that has like a fixed power supply. Now the fans are interesting because hopefully this is gonna come out, but yeah, they did really easily. Um, you know, th this is a little fan module and what you're gonna notice is that this is a uh, Microtik hot swap fan. And you know, it's, it's a pretty small, like little 40 millimeter fan. And one project that we were gonna do with this, and it was kind of funny, uh, was really the idea of let's swap out the fans and see if we could get something that's a little bit quieter because that's something that we see a lot of folks do with Microtik switches just to kind of get that, you know, lower noise floor. One of the things that you'll see is a lot of folks will go and get Noctua fans and put them in here. So before doing this video, I had one of our new team members, Brian, he's actually our second, 
Brian with a Y. Uh, but our, one of our new team members, Brian, I said, hey, Brian, could you go grab some of the Noctua fans that we have in the box and then, uh, you know, put those in and like, as you're kind of building out the switch, why don't you go do the Noctua swap and just kind of see how that goes. And he comes into my office and he's uh, he brings them over and he's like, uh, hey boss, um, so I, I don't know I don't know what you want me to do here. And the reason is because the new Microtik, I guess how they have this set up is they don't use just kind of like a standard four pin PWM connector. And we'll see a lot of like these hot swap things is it'll be like a little uh, like adapter board that'll go from like a four pin PWM fan to a thing that's kind of more of like a hot swap mating type of connector. And this one does not have that. It has this kind of like little ribbon cable that is the, uh, you know, all, all the pins that you need. It's still a four pin one. So my guess is that if you wanted to get, uh, you know, your, your, your wire cutters out and stuff, you probably could make this work. But at the same time, this is not as easy is just uh, you know putting in like a new fan and just screwing it in. So anyway, we're not gonna do that project, but I definitely think it's possible. It's just, I don't wanna be telling people to go cut up stuff. And so uh, if you wanna go do that, it's at your own risk. I also wanna show you just this little tiny detail that Microtik does something that other vendors don't do. And I think everybody should do this in the industry. So what you'll see here, and hopefully you can see this, maybe you can't, is that we have the rack here installed and then there's the chassis screw. So if you wanna take off this lid, the chassis screw on this rack here is not covered covered by the rack here, which means you have direct access and it's like right here and you can actually go and, and unscrew it and then be able to take the top off. That may not seem like a big deal, but other rack gears will cover that screw, which would mean that if you wanted to get inside, you'd have to take off the rack gear and then you'd be able to unscrew that screw with then getting into the chassis. That may sound like the world's smallest detail. And frankly, it probably is. On the other hand, it is a nice little quality of life thing. And I really like the fact that Microtik is taking these little tiny attention to detail because uh, you know, if they don't do it, then we all have to suffer, right? So it's awesome that they're doing it and more folks should do it too. Okay, so looking inside the switch, there are a couple of features that are, uh, you know, definitely ones that we have to call out because they're really kind of interesting design choices by Microtik. So the first one I just want to call out is actually up front in the QSFP 28 cages. What you'll see is that these actually have relatively giant heat sinks. And I know folks are gonna say, what do you mean by that? These are actually relatively giant heat sinks. So I figured this is a, uh, this is actually a Facebook wedge 100 switch. This is actually the, one of the switches that Facebook would use to go and run, run Facebook. And uh, if you, if you look here at the QSFP cages, these things don't even have heat sinks. And so the QSFP 28 generation, you just didn't have as large of heat sinks on top of these. We've definitely seen switches that do have them, um, but but this is not an example of like extreme ones in any, any shape, form, whatever. But on the Microtik side, there are relatively large heat sinks on the QSFP to make sure that the optics don't overheat. I think that the difference is that the Facebook Wedge 100 is of course running in a data center and it's assuming that there's gonna be some pretty decent airflow through the chassis, whereas the Microtik is trying to minimize fan speeds, and that's why we see these large heat sinks. The big feature here is clearly the heat sink and the switch, really, that's underneath that heat sink. The heat sink is hiding a Marvell Prestera and then an Aldrin 2 switch chip, and that's the 98DX8525. That switch chip is responsible for all of the 25 gig and 100 gig ports. Basically everything else in the system is run off of the Qualcomm management processor. Now behind that management processor, we have the fan controller board, and that board is responsible for connecting all the hot swap fans in the back. The power supplies, they connect directly into the main switch PCB. Overall, this is a super simple switch design, and that's important because Microtik is really trying to keep costs down. Okay, so now that we've looked at the hardware, the next thing I think we need to look at is the management situation, because I think that, that for Microtix switches is really like one of the biggest differentiators, right? So this is not just a CLI, there is a CLI, and that is the standard router OS CLI, um, but it's not just a CLI switch, and I think that's important, because you have the ability that, you know, if you need something like a Winbox to be able to go, which is a local application, a Windows application that you can go run, and you can use that to go and manage these switches. The other thing that you can use though is the webfig which is very very similar to winbox but it just uses the web management interface for the switch and then once you're in there um, you definitely have a very powerful management interface Microtik in the switch series with these Marvell switches, they have introduced like like layer three offloading and offload features. This is definitely more, I, I would use it more as a L2, maybe L2 plus switch, but the, but you know, that is a, is a possibility. But frankly, what that means is that there are a ton of options 
that you don't see in other switches. Like for example, on the STH main site, we probably do a new fiber store or fs.com switch review, like probably, I don't know, maybe once a month or something like that. And if you look at their interfaces, they have a lot of things that are, you know, important like VLANs and being able to set those if they have a management interface. You know, you see things like, like you can go and do VLANs and that's pretty par for the course. You can see port status and do some kind of basic flow control stuff. But if you go look at things that are in like the, the, the web fig or something like that in router OS 6.7, there are things like, hey, let's go set up like a, a wire guard VPN or, you know, let's set up things like a time server or just all kinds Kinds of different things that you might want to go do. There's just a ton of different options. And then there are other things like, hey, if you want to go run a bandwidth test or something like that, you can even do that directly from the switch and just from the UI. I mean, there are just a ton of options here. And why I think that that's super important for a company like Microtik is really that these switches are not necessarily going to take a hardcore Cisco admin. Like if you're like a CCNA, and like all you do all day is Cisco, you're probably not going to go want to use a just kind of web interface from Microtik right? But on the other hand, you're probably also not buying a Microtik switch. You're probably just going to keep buying Cisco switches. Now for another set of folks, they're really looking at, you know, like their, SM, their SMB customers or maybe home users. And all of a sudden they're finding like, Hey, this 25 gig gear is getting kind of inexpensive. What you'll see is that with PCA Gen 5, you can start doing 400 gig ports in a server. And when you can do 400 gig ports, all of a sudden hundred gig networking looks pretty slow. And so we'll start seeing hundred gig, you know, kind of gear move into like eBay and just kind of move into the secondary market. And that price prices for the 100 gig gear is just going to come down. And why that trickle down really matters is because that allows the next set of customers, really the SMB customers to start accessing 25 gig and 100 gig networking. And for those folks, if you know you have a couple, you know, 25 gig things or maybe 100 gig storage server all of a sudden and maybe some 25 gig clients, well, you know, having if you have one or two of these switches in your office, maybe this is all all you need and maybe I don't want to have to actually go learn the Cisco CLI, maybe I just want to spend 5 minutes and go click things in a web GUI and be all set up with my network right? Or maybe you just have a small colo deployment or something like that. And you just want to spend five, 10 minutes just configuring the switch using a GUI where there are tool tips and, you know, how to guides on how to do everything versus having to go through a CLI. I totally understand that. On the other hand, if you're like totally engrossed in a CLI, then you just don't care. But, you know, I think there's a new class of customers that this really appeals to. Okay, so on the performance side, we were able to go and load up all of the, the switch ports. So all the 25 gig as well as the 200 gig ports. And, uh, you know, we just kind of plugged stuff into it and said like, hey, how much how much bandwidth can we get? And we got, we got uh, you know, just under one terabit per second uh, in, in full duplex mode. And I think we were just under, we were over 500, between like 500 and 600 uh, gigabits per second in uh, in half duplex mode. And, you know, frankly, I think that's a really good result for a switch like this, right? And this is, uh, this is definitely not the, the you know, most expensive switch or anything like that. And I do think that we could have done more network tuning and stuff like that. But it's literally just like plugging stuff in. Hey, let's go and see what we can get. And we got pretty darn good numbers, frankly. I'm also just going to flash up. These are the Microtik numbers. They have fancier gear for uh, testing networks than we do because they're they're a switch company, of course, they're a router switch company. So they uh, they have fancier gear, and that's what they say they can do uh, in terms of packets per second as well as gigabits per second. Okay, so next, I think the big question uh, a lot of folks are going to want to know is uh, power consumption and noise. Okay, so now the game plan is I'm going to plug this in just so you can hear what it sounds like. It's also going to be plugged into the power meter. Uh, I'm just going to tell you what the power meter says instead of uh, instead of doing the overhead rig because I think this is just too big. But let me uh, let me let me go plug this in and just kind of give you a, give you a little listen. And while this is booting up, you're going to definitely hear it. This is about how far the mics are or mic is from the uh, the unit. And something that is kind of nice is that these actually do these power supplies. Uh, let me pull one out actually, since we can show that this is you know working in a redundant fashion. As you can see, we're actually running in a redundant mode right now. And uh, here's here's one of the power supplies. And just one of the nice things about this is that you also have, uh, and I'll just kind of show you guys this real quick right here. You actually have this locking mechanism, so you're able to lock the power supply or the power cord in place. So I really kind of like that Microtik does that. I wish more switch vendors did that. And then here, let me give you a little listen of, uh, let me put this next to the power supply. This is about this is about four inches away from the mic. And just for some sense of like the base, just absolute base level uh, power consumption, you're at about 15.8, 15.7 watts or so. So just very, very low power consumption 
overall for this. Okay, let's do that again, and let's let's have you let you listen to the startup sequence because it's a little bit louder, kind of give you an idea of what this does. So here's the thing starting up, and just on startup, this thing is at about 19.8 to 20 watts or so. So given the fact that we saw that this thing is running basically at 15, 16 watts, you might be wondering why Microtech says this is like you know a 44, 45 watt switch or up to maybe you know 77 or you know as you see in some numbers say 99 watts. The reason for that is a couple fold. So just taking those 16 ports right there, even if you're just to go use something, I'll just say you're gonna use like a 10G base T adapter or something like that. Uh, these things will use say two and a half watts when they're plugged in and go through power supplies and get a little lost too. So, you know, this is maybe like a, like a two and a half watt impact to a system. And if you have 16 of them, all of a sudden you have like 40 watts of power consumption just from uh, 16 of these things, just as an example. And I think we did one where we had the uh, 100 gig module on the QSFP side, so it was a CWDM, so two kilometer model. And then we had a um, optical breakout cable. So, you know, a 100 gig optical breakout to uh, four 25 gigs. And then we had a single, I think SFP plus, which was actually to the R86S, which you may have seen the review of recently. But, you know, we just had that kind of configuration set up and I think we were sitting at like 24 watts or something like that. So I really think that with this switch, the power is like maybe 15, 16 watts plus whatever the optics and whatever you're gonna be connecting to this. So in summary on the power consumption and noise, not that much power and noise is pretty darn reasonable. It's definitely audible, it's not silent and power supplies are actually probably the louder bits in this thing. But um, overall, you know, I think Microtech did a great job of this. If this is tucked away in like a closet somewhere or anything like that, you're not gonna hear it. But that kind of brings me to the point of like, well, who is this switch really for? So that brings us to pricing. Now, pricing on this, the list price is $1,595 or $99, something like that. Um, so it's like basically $1,600 list price. We have seen some stores go and put, you know, prices down into around a little over $1,500. So usually there's a gap between the Microtech list price and what, what companies actually sell or resellers actually sell them at. I would say that the Microtech discounts are not as great as we used to see pre-pandemic and all the supply chain stuff. But that really brings me to my next point and perhaps the one that is gonna be the most controversial. Because this switch I really like. Like I'm, I'm this and my key lessons learned. I'm definitely gonna say I like this switch. But I think that there are other things in the Microtech portfolio that are gonna give people pause at least when they look at a switch like this because this is really good if you need a lot of ports um, and especially a lot of like SFP 28, 25 gig ports. But if you need more like 100 gig ports, um, well Microtech has a new switch that might even be a better option. Now some of our Eagle Eye YouTube viewers out there will probably have noticed that there's actually a Microtech. CRS 504, which is a four port, 100 gig model. And that one over there, I think the list price on that is just under $800. And uh, you, know, you can find them, I think sometimes for a little over $700. But if you don't need all of the SFP 28 and you need fewer ports and stuff like that, or you need more 100 gig, I actually think that the CRS 504 makes a lot more sense. But that pricing really gets me to the key lessons learned. And let's talk about the switch and like, like who's gonna use it, who's gonna like it, who's just gonna go bash it online. And uh, let, let's kind of get into some of that here. So first off, you know, if, if you're just buying and you just want a lot of 25 gig ethernet ports, like that's your goal is just, hey, I want a lot of ports. I want more 100 gig ports and stuff like that. This is not the right switch for you, right? There are definitely 48 port 25 gig switches that are super easy to get. And so, you know, I, I just kind of think that we've purchased in this price range, a lot of 48 port 25 gig switches previously. And so I don't necessarily think that if you're a power user, you just want lots of ports, lots of performance, and you want to use a CLI, I, I would just get something on eBay. The trade-offs with doing that are kind of obvious though. Number one, you're getting some kind of random switch on eBay. Two, uh, you probably have a CLI that may be a little different from Cisco or whatever you're used to, but uh, you know, you will have a CLI. It may be, um, you may be more familiar than the Microtech one, but on the other hand, um, you know, you're not gonna get that web interface experience. You're also gonna have higher power consumption and higher noise, but you will get more performance and few more ports, right? So I, I just kind of think that if you are of that mind where you just want like maximum port count, I, I really think that something like that is gonna be a better option for a lot of folks. Yet at the other hand, if you don't need the amount of ports that this has, then getting the CRS 504 makes a lot of sense. And I know you're probably thinking, hey, Patrick, when are you gonna review that? 
definitely coming up. Uh, this is just part of a micro tick review series and this is just gonna kind of kick off that new series, right? So we're gonna do that one. And I think that that's probably the better option if you just need, you know, a couple. Like if you have a small like single rack or something like that, get the CRS 504, use breakout cables and be done with it. It's a lower power device. I just think that that's a, that's a better option for you. If you need the higher port count though, I, I think that this makes a lot of sense. And I know there are folks out there that are gonna say like, hey Patrick, $1,500 for like a home lab switch is a lot. I totally think that's true. On the other hand, remember that um, number one, it's a lot less than a lot of other switches on the market. But also, uh, you know, I think that especially if you're gonna go put in something like have like a colo or something like that, I think that this is a really good option for something that's not overly expensive. We've been running the other ones. So th we have two of these and uh, the other one's been running for a while in with Rohit and Rohit said, yeah, we haven't seen any, uh, any major hiccups on it yet uh, with the new router OS 6, uh, sorry, 7.6. So I, I, I kind of think that that's something that, um, you know, I think that they're doing a pretty good job of. There usually are little weird things to MicroTik switches. So definitely that'd be something to go look in the forums. If there's a specific feature that you want, maybe ask that in the for in their forums. But if you just need to go plug in a whole bunch of devices and make a network and you, know, you don't really want to want to deal with something that is like a super loud switch, you don't want to have to learn a CLI, any of that kind of stuff. I think that this makes a lot of sense. And with that guys, I hope you enjoyed this look at the MicroTik CRS518. I think this is a killer switch. I'm super excited. And uh, frankly, I hope that the supply on these gets a little bit better because we're probably gonna be buying one or two more of these. Uh, MicroTik actually sent this one, the other one we bought, and then uh, we're probably gonna be buying a couple more of these uh, when we can actually get them. But hopefully uh, supply chain gets a little bit easier because it has not been super easy to purchase these. And hey, if you did like this video and you can't wait to see our CRS504 video and all the other great content that we have, why don't you give this video a like, click subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.